What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Bread to Build podcast, a project dedicated to sharing the stories of the people who build and those who help move construction forward. If you like what you're doing, you want to support us on this journey, all we ask is you hit that little subscribe button, maybe give us a little shouty shout on social media. My name is Brett Gowen. I'm the founder of Hammer and Builders of Insta. Today, as always, joined by my co-host, Matt Pinella. As always, you sounded super stoked there. What's up, guys? It's Matt Pinella, also known as Matt Bangswood, carpenter and YouTuber based out of Central California. God, you nail the intro every time, Matt. It's the only 10, 10 words I say. Yeah, it's good. It's a good 10. We're going to change it up. Professional yeah. wee bowler. Oh, I out. like that. I like that. That's good. Um, today, we're hopping on with Marcus Gores. He's the, uh, the vice president over at Gores Construction based out of Milwaukee, Oregon. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, some of his past life spinning records, taking over the family business, what it's like running a company of about 100 full-time employees at the age of 29, and uh, how he's building their machine to attract and retain the next generation workforce. Marcus, welcome to the Bread to Build podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah, we got to clap. Matt, you got to lead that, man. There we go. We got to get the hype up. I appreciate you guys having me on today. Thank you very much. It's going to be a lot of fun. You you have an interesting story here. Yeah. Well, I'm ready for wherever you guys are. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on, man. Uh, we've chatted a little bit before. I think the last time that we were talking, I called you and uh, you were out hunting on a, a kayak or whatever the hell you were doing. Uh, duck hunting. Yeah, it was a storm day. Uh, we had a, a snow week in between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And so uh, like everyone else, uh, I, we weren't on job sites. So uh, I got out in the kayak and was just hunting ducks, waterfowl and geese and having a good time with my family. I'm sorry. Love- I, I, I live by the beach. So as soon as you said hunting on a kayak, my dumb ass pictured you in the ocean. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what in the fuck are you shooting out in the ocean? <laughs> shooting sharks. <laughs> that makes more sense. Uh, beach chickens, Matt. That's what they're called where you are. Yep. Well, I guess where I am too. Um, awesome, Marcus. Uh, before we uh, start, give us a quick little rundown of course, construction, uh, the family business and uh, kind of what you guys do. And then we'll just dive in. Yeah, most definitely. So Gores Construction is a multifaceted construction company. Uh, We started 23, 24 years ago, uh, specializing in defect repair, which means we fix everybody's screw ups. So all the homes where, you know, people installed EVE systems, didn't understand uh, drainage plane, flashings, uh, how to egress water here in the Pacific Northwest, where we get a ton of rain, uh, we would go in and fix them. So we'd strip buildings, uh, put it back together the right way uh, with egress abilities for water, water management, uh, and just proper installation of materials. We started uh, in a single family residence platform, uh, and then we grew into the multifamily platform. So HOA communities, uh, townhomes, mid-rises, high-rises, apartment complexes, uh, things like that. So we specialize now in working with multifamily housing uh, and fixing their sick buildings. Uh, we strip them down to studs, expose sheeting, and, and put their cladding back together the proper way. Uh, deck coatings, roofs, uh, railings, framing, dry rot repairs, siding, stucco. Uh, we do it all. Uh, and so we've been doing that. Uh, Gorse Construction, we got 100 uh, employees on payroll, uh, roughly, and then about another 150 uh, direct subcontractors that only work for Gorse Construction. A lot of those subcontractors are previous full-time employees of Gorse Construction, and we've helped them kind of get uh, on their way uh, of their next milestone and chapter in their life and in business by helping them and, and giving them work and keeping them busy with having their own crews and, and running their own businesses. So it's really awesome to see. I have some, some folks uh, you know, who've worked for us for a really long time and, and still work for us, but now they're kind of running their own show and scheduling and things like that. So it's fun to see. But a lot of moving parts. Uh, we have a design division, um, architect in-house, drafts details, plans, um, can get permits. Uh, we also have a TI uh, remodel and new construction division that my sister Jacqueline runs. Uh, she gets to deal with all the fun, pretty cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just get to deal with, uh, you know, putting square feet on the wall and uh, putting, putting squares on the roofs. Uh, and then um, I have a service department uh, who's run by my uncle. Uh, my uncle Henre, uh, we do, that's all small jobs, odd jobs, one window, one deck, one door, basically anything under a hundred grand contract goes to service and maintenance. Uh, and anything over that we take in the large production side. I do all of our bidding and estimating, uh, and I do all of our transitions from signed contract to mobilization. And then I have an amazing field staff made up of PM, supers, operations managers, vice president, um, and, you know, carpenters, 
window installers, deck coders, uh, roofers, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of different things. Uh, but in turn, we, we fix bad building. Um, we do it a lot. And it's out of Oregon, Washington. We pushed a development in Idaho. Um, and in Utah, we have an office over there off of California Ave in Salt Lake do a lot of work down there. And we're working on a uh, new design project, a single family home, 25,000 square foot, single family, single level. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So, and where's, uh, where's that at? A palace. Uh, they actually bought three homes in three neighboring lots, knocked all of them down. So we yep. can insulate. That sounds so California. My yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, first off, I, I love the fact that you guys are open to employees growing and eventually yeah. doing their own thing. Um, that was the first thing that stood out to me. A lot of people really take that as like a, a negative thing mm -hmm. when in reality, you should think of it as like, you've given them these tools that can allow them to go out and do it and make more. Like that's a beautiful thing. And then keeping them around too is even more um, awesome to hear that you guys do. Yeah. I looked through your guys's little deal on your website and you have a lot of family working for you. Mm -hmm. um, first off, how, do, how does that work? I, I've, I work with family as well. You guys all get along. Everything goes pretty smooth. Yeah. So we, we all, uh, it, it's compartmentalized in yeah. our areas of, of work. And, and we really understand each other very well and knowing where our expertise is. Uh, you know, can I, can I design and stage furniture on a remodel? No, but who's really good at it? My sister, Jacqueline. Can That's I do awesome. all of her invoicing accounts, receivable accounts, payable? No, but my wife is amazing at it. Caitlin. Um, you know, I'm filling my father's shoes as he's on uh, his succession plan. Uh, so I do a lot of the same things as him. And it's kind of funny when I used to pester him, you know, five, six years ago, you know, Hey, how can I help you? What do you need help with? I can take on more. It's, it's reversed in the roles. He's now, you know, popping into my office, you know, how can I help you? Do you need me to measure anything? Like, what do you got for me? And it's like, no, man, go enjoy life. Like you've worked so hard your whole life to, to build this uh, empire and, and I'm going to work my butt off and everyone's going to work their butt off to, to keep it going and make it bigger and better every single day. Uh, awesome. So we all kind of have our separate departments and, and we work well and we know our, our strengths and we know our weaknesses and, and we lean on each other as weaknesses. I will say um, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week with my family, um, my weekends or my off time, uh, I'd spend by myself or with my wife and my dog. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing nothing or being outdoors, um, hunting, fishing, hiking, that type of thing, just to kind of recharge, you know, get away from people because you end up working with a lot of people and, and uh, how our company set up. Yeah, Sometimes absolutely. you just want to be by yourself. Yeah. So, so this is second, second generation company, correct? Yeah. Second generation. And, and, and uh, my dad and my uncles are uh, uh, immigrants. So I'm a first generation American. Um, um, that's so, awesome. Yeah. And I'm also in the first generation of uh, Gorses who have uh, graduated from college. So a lot of firsts. Um, I'm up there with you too, man. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. You know, my dad, my uncles, my aunts uh, came to America from the Middle East and, um, you know, didn't have education, uh, but they just had a drive to, to do better and work harder. And and so that that those bones definitely passed down generation to generation, that hard work and bone in our body. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, pretty cool. The land of uh, opportunity. It, 100%. Exactly. So how, how many, also I was curious, how many family members, Gores, are actually working in the business today? Gosh, uh, today, uh, Henry, Sean, Debbie, uh -huh. Jacqueline, can you, can you... The, the pressure's on. Eight? Eight That's Gorses? Awesome. And they're all... That's awesome. Yeah. And I've had, I mean, and I've employed my little cousins as well while they're going mm -hmm. to college and school. Uh, my, my cousin Jacob just graduated from Oregon State with an engineering degree, and he just got a stellar job. Uh, but he worked with me, um, you know, swinging hammer while he, you know, during summer breaks, winter breaks, spring break. So uh, it, it, it shifts. I mean, we bring on folks uh, during our off time or during their off time while they're going to school and um, kind of touching back on that, you know, that uh, stepping stone for folks to, to go and do better uh, and do more and, and kind of grow into their own business. Um, one of the biggest things that I implement, I do all of our hiring and firing. And I really like doing the, the first part of that. And I really like <laughs> yeah. the latter part of that. Uh, but during the hiring, uh, you know, I, I asked folks, you know, what are your goals in life? And, and do, I'm not by no means do I want to hear that. Oh, I'm going to work here forever. I want to know what you really want to do so I can help you get there. And I always treat, you know, folks employment here as a stepping stone. If you need hours on the job for your apprenticeship application, I'll give it to you. I'll train you. I'll do as much as I can to help you out to get there. Um, you know, and if you want to go run your own construction company, at least learn good construction practices. 
proper yeah. building practices, insulation, and we're the people to do it with. So I'm not saying there's not other people to do that with, but I, I'm, I'm accepting knowing that I don't have workforce forever and I treat it like I don't have them forever. So I appreciate every single minute or chance or opportunity that I get out of all the folks that work with us, not for me, but with me. Everyone's a team member here. I love That's that. Cool. I, I, I think we'll come back to uh, the, the culture around that and kind of like investing in your workforce and giving them that stepping stone. That, that's why I was actually so excited to have you on the podcast today, because like you don't hear every single construction company running their operation, like what you're running it like today. And you got to invest in people present. So, <laughs> uh, but Matt, feel free to take so it away. Let, we can come back to culture. It, take it back just a bit. Some people don't want to take over the family business and others openly embrace it. What is your story? And did you always imagine kind of taking over that family business? Not at all. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I guess off the record without Bureau of Labor and Industry listening, I started here sweeping our shop floors at 13 and my dad paid me, right? So I got to learn the shop, what's going on in the shop, uh, the materials, storing them, stacking them and understanding, you know, what materials are used out in the field, what tools are used. I didn't use them at that age, but I understood them and, and you know, got the terminology down, uh, 13 and 14. So during my, my summer breaks, and then as soon as I got a license, uh, I wanted to get out on job set. And Bureau and Labor and of uh, Bureau and Labor and Industry won't let you work power tools uh, until you're 18 years old without yep, some I, permit. I signed one of those forms. You have to sign a form yeah. saying you can't do it. Yeah. And so basically, I was I was stoked. I got a license. I got you know I was, I'm out on the job site. Just finished school a week ago. Started Monday, and the guys gave me a broom and a dustpan all summer for two summers. <laughs> And they're like, yep, go move this unit of, of CDX from over here to over here and go clean up after everything we do. And so I, I kind of started at the bottom here. Um, but I, when I was younger, I never really had the intentions of like, I want to be a construction worker. It was just something I did because it was in the family and yeah. I knew it. Um, and I went to school. Um, I, went, I graduated from high school a year early, but in high school, uh, I got turntables for Christmas. And that just started a musical bone in my body. Um, played <laughs> instruments. I can play it. I can make noise on a lot of instruments. You can't read sheet music, but I can make, you know, I can play quite a few instruments. But um, so I got turntables and I took them to college with me. And everyone in college was like, oh, well, you, you got to play at this, this party. And no, oh, you got to play at this bar. And, and they finally took me into bars at 17 years old. And I was spinning records at bars and clubs um, in college. And it kind of just escalated from there. And then I finally started playing live shows for uh, actual hip hop musicians. So I've done, uh, you know, West Coast tours for GEZ, for uh, Too Short, E40, uh, Tyga, 2 Chains, you know, a lot of hip hop artists and had a really fun time doing that. But I had this like pivotal moment in my life uh, where my father is like, sat me down and said, you know, I, I am either going to decide to sell this company either back to the employees and it's going to be an employee owned company, or you're going to figure it out and you're going to want to come to work. And this is a nest egg for you and your sister and your spouses when you get married to grow off of and learn from and run. And um, so from there, uh, my dad said, basically, I'm, I'm either going to plan to start selling this thing off or you're going to shape up. And the very next day, I sold all my music equipment and moved home, uh, finished out college uh, at home and uh, started working full time. So I had a fun stint of music in my life. I still love music. Um, I don't have any of my equipment. I have some instruments still. I have some instruments in my office here. But uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I've, I've done quite a few different things, uh, but it really came back to that pivotal moment of, you know, what do I want to do in life? And do I want to walk away from something that I actually care about? And it took me having a real hard, you know, reality check of, is the music life sustainable for me? Is it going to be something that I can be married and do? Can I have children and be traveling around the country playing live mm. shows every night? And I, I just had this epiphany of, you know, swinging hammers, building stuff doesn't sound so bad. You know, 730 to four o'clock, not a bad gig. Monday to Friday, I know where my paycheck's going to be. I can build my own house. You know, it, it has a future and you can see it. And with music, it was like, you have aspirations, but they're not always contracted. So it's like, you don't know where your next tour is going to be. You don't know where your next gig is going to be until it's signed. But with construction, I always knew I had a home uh, and, I, and I came back to home and, and really figured it out. With, with music, it's kind of tough too, because you typically only have 
X amount of time while you're popping off in order to make it and make your money and get your contracts and stuff. So that, that makes sense that you would settle down with something like construction. Yeah. Um, sounds like you made a good choice though. Yeah, so so. <laughs> are, are you bags on or are you purely managing and, and running the show from behind now? I keep my Occidentals in my truck. There we uh, go. And love uh, to hear that Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep them in my truck. My mucks are standing in front of me uh, because we get a lot of rain and mud here. Um, so I'll put it this way. Um, I do all of our estimating. Um, I do all of our client relations and I basically, from the time I estimate a project to contracting a documents, um, to turning it over to field and mobilization. I do all of that. As soon as they mobilize, I try to part ways with that. So I can focus on the next six, 10, 12, 16 months worth of projects upcoming to make sure we have, you know, projects for the future. And I, you know, we don't lay people off or hire people, uh, specific to projects. I keep all our crews busy year round. We run 12 to 15 projects uh, at a time, uh, rough scale from three to 6 million uh, per project. So, Damn. Uh, yeah, so it's a lot of work to try and keep busy. So I don't really get bags on time, but I did bid a project, flangeless VPI windows on a mid-rise downtown Portland, Eve system stripped down to steel studs, remove the insulation in the wall, put new dense glass on, fluid applied waterproofing, install new VPI windows and doors. And since I bid the project and went through all the uh, RFIs, all of the basically design intent with the architects, I knew how to install these windows with their, you know, double sill flashings, their uh, structural back angle attachments, things like that. So for the first three weeks of windows, I was bags on installing with my crews uh, shoulder to shoulder with them. So that way they could get the hang of what it was and how it went together. Yep. And so I go out on job sites still. Um, I just try not to micromanage. I have full faith in my field. Jeff Mills, our vice president, I have full faith in him. Uh, all our PMs, uh, you know, they're all really good people. And the fun thing is at Gorris, like my vice president, Jeff Mills, he started here as a carpenter 22 years ago. That's crazy. All of my PMs worked with bags on here at Gorris. All my supers mm -hmm. worked with bags on. Um, I don't go shop out and go hire PMs. I promote that, that makes things so much better. Yeah. The majority of, of PMs that I've worked with don't want to lift a finger. No. And oftentimes that makes it to where they don't understand what's actually going on either. Structability. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one of the biggest things. They know our processes. They know our concept and the, the quality we provide. I'm not the cheapest guy in town and I'm not going to go drop our drawers or, or cut discounts to try and get work because I know quality work comes with a cost. So yeah. in doing that, everyone knows our quality, our standards. There's no shortcuts, no corner cutting, because we're in the business of fixing other bad buildings. I don't want to get in the business of people fixing my buildings. Yeah, they went with the cheap price to begin with, and that's yeah. why they're hiring you. Yeah. If, if you think I'm an expensive contractor, wait till you hire the cheap contractor. It's going to get real expensive. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you're there to fix it. Yep, 100%. <laughs> I'll be back. I leave a business card. I'll, I'll see you in three years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about is uh, I, we don't really get the opportunity to talk to another, I, I mean, I'm 29, you're 29, to talk with another guy that's running this size of business at, at this stage in his life. I would imagine that this type of operation right now is no walk in the park. I mean, we were even talking about it before we started the podcast. Um, but what, what has been the, like the process for you taking over the business um, that operates in multiple cities, states, having dozens, if not more projects running at the same time. Like, what was that transition like for you? It was it, when I was younger, it was tough. So I, I kind of got out of my bags like six years ago, truly five, six years ago. Um, like, cause as a PM, I would still throw my bags on and work with the guys. Cause no offense, uh, with the drive in my last name on everybody's shirt and on the buildings, I, the quality I wanted I needed to have bags on myself. It was hard for me to transition out of bags and focusing microscopically on what I was producing to looking at a global uh, global picture of how this company functions and what's sustainable. Um, the other thing was, is, you know, five, six years ago, I was 23, 24 years old. So uh, yeah, I had guys working, you know, everyone's my team member here. I'll, I'll, I'll put this out there very clearly. Everyone's my team member. I'm not above or below anyone and mm -hmm. everyone is just as important. The guys who are sweeping are just as important as the guys who are doing the billing as the girls who are, uh, you know, putting siding on the walls. And we do employ both male and female workers. Um, so I, everyone's an equal, but the guys I had under me, once I started jumping that, you know, kind of rank of a position, um, I was fighting an uphill battle because of my age. And I don't anymore over the last like two or three years, people understand and have faith in my ability to ensure they have a job 
and ensure that I'm going to keep them busy. And, and the work that I do is making sure essentially that they have a paycheck every two weeks mm -hmm. and that they have a sustainable career. Um, so it took a transition of people kind of testing me and not having mm -hmm. faith in me and me working harder to gain that respect from the people that I had once worked below side by side with and now in a, in a, in a role that is, um, you know, above them in a sense, but I don't treat myself as any better than any of them. So, um, that was a, a tough transitional period for me. And I think this year, um, uh, uh, this year temperament is what I focus on. Uh, I don't focus on specific installations. I don't focus on, uh, crunching P and L or focusing on why we're losing dollars here or there. I focus on uplifting in a positive manner. And that's one of the biggest things. I mean, I have a, a PM a couple of doors down right now, who's doing all this pre-con for a project that starts and the amount of, of confidence he has in himself preparing for the project that he is just introduced to within the last three to four weeks, um, has been a lot greater than how I used to introduce our pre-construction with, you need to know this, you should know this, you've been doing this for a while. So without taking the stern hand on it, I've been taking the open and uplifting and supportive. Um, and it does take a lot more of my time, but the outcome and, and the, the product, the work product and the production that comes from it, when you have the confidence um, on the site, like my PMs and supers do, and it, it trickles down to their leads and their carpenters mm -hmm. and their window setters, it, it's been trickling down. So I've taken a, a, a super positive uh, direction towards all of our crew members. I mean, it's being able to crack jokes and laugh and smile. And, you know, before you have to ask me tough questions, I, you know, I need you to tell me the joke of the day. I, I need you, I'm going to answer the phone and I'm going to sing you a song. Or <laughs> I love I just, that. one of my super's birthdays was on Monday. I called him and, and sung him happy birthday at 730 in the morning when he started. So just little things yeah. you know, influence positivity here and create a good culture here at Gorse Construction is important to me. Um, you know, we were voted at, um, from our, uh, the DJC is the best company culture and construction in Oregon. Um, and I take pride in that. And that was voted by our clients and our workforce. I didn't get the chance to vote. I can't vote for myself. None yeah. of our administrative can. It's all people who work here and all people who have interacted with our folks who work here. And they can see that, you know, our folks take pride in it and, and they care about, it's not just a job for them. You know, this is their passion. This is what they love to do. So it, it's, I guess, there has been tough transitional parts in running this company and growing in my role here and taking on more and more. But I think as I take more of that positive outlook, it, it's becoming easier. It's more work, it's more time, but it's becoming easier and it's an easier conversation to have. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I used to get, uh, I, I used to get mad. Now I don't get mad. I briefly get disappointed and then I react in a positive manner. So there's things like that. Like, yeah, I'm disappointed this happened. Yeah, we might be losing money on this at this point. How do we fix it immediately? And how do we move forward from here and learn from this mistake? Exactly. You know, as opposed to, you know, grow, I don't, grow I need, with it. Yeah, I don't need to fly off the handle. I don't need to swear at people. Like, this is not a good environment. It fixes nothing. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that, that's just the culture that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, uh, implement even more here. And yeah, it's a family business, but we're a corporation. But we keep that family relations. I can tell you everybody's first and last name. I can tell you mm -hmm. their houses, their children. I know how, what they drive, who they are, their personal dilemmas. I mean, I'm, I'm that personable with every single person I have. On yeah. Them. You're invested in your people. Yep. They're my um, big asset. 100%. That's good. One, one question that I wanted to ask you, Marcus, um, you know, maybe for some of the younger fellows, uh, listening to the podcast, um, you know, you were talking about building credibility and trust as you were kind of moving up, whether like you can call it rankings or whatever. What were some of those like key moments or things that you were doing to build your credibility and trust for anyone listening to the podcast as, you know, like moving up in the ladder within their company or thinking about starting their own business or, you know, uh, moving that guy or gal along that journey within the company? What, what were some of those key moments and things you did? Um, one of the biggest things was uh, take ownership of my work product. Um, you, you know, if it was, if it was positive or negative, like you have to have a, a sense of pride in what you do. Like, I love taking the last half an hour of the day to clean up and not just clean up, take 20 steps back from where you've been working and look what you did and appreciate because mm -hmm. you just got that done. You know, one of the biggest things is, um, you know, uh, specific trade related, um, you know, when you have rough framers only, they don't get to see the finished product of the home that they just built. Um, so, you know, being able to go back and look at those things and, and take pride in your work. So, 
you know, stepping mm -hmm. back and, and taking accountability and, and, you know, uh, taking pride in the work product I was doing, you know, it, it wasn't just a clock in clock out thing for me. I was investing in my career, my work product, and it showed people uh, around me that, you know, this guy actually cares, mm -hmm. you know, not just about his work product, but the people too. Uh, and so that was one of the big things. The other thing that comes to mind when you ask this question is a, a John F. Kennedy quote that, uh, that I really, really live by, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Mm -hmm. Okay. So servant, it's servant not, leadership. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. So I reward folks that go above and beyond their existing responsibilities and their roles to better our processes and performance. So if you go out of your way, it's not, well, I don't get paid enough for that. You would, if you did it, yeah. you know, those types of things. So it, that's what it did. It wasn't, oh, that's not my job. It was, I'm going to take it on. I don't need to ask for more money to do it either. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure at some point it's going to reciprocate, right? Yeah. And that's the type of company we are. We reciprocate, re re reciprocate those types of things when people go above and beyond what is asked of them. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's, I'll tell you, Gorse Construction is not a hard place to work. I mean, I don't, I, I don't work folks to the, uh, you know, folks till death. I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, work against the bones. It's a super, super relaxed and controlled place to work. Um, and I pride ourselves on good, good people working here, uh, willingness to train, uh, great communication, respect. So when you give that respect coming through the ranks in that transitional period for me, I got that respect. And then you have to show it with what you're producing. So, um, you know, going above and beyond without needing uh, immediate gratification uh, or, uh, you know, a benefit based on doing something outside of my work role or my scope, um, you know, it, it, it panned out and it got me that extra leap, you know, that, oh, I'm going to help those guys because I'm done with my task or I'm going to go clean up their workstation because I'm already done cleaning up mine. You know, things like that. It was like, wow, this guy wants to help me. This guy wants to work yeah. with me. Um, or even as, you know, even as, as Hefe, as boss, throwing on your bags. Like that's one of the craziest things that, um, you know, folks see like, I'm, I'm, I'm on a board of directors here. Like I, I'm, I'm sit behind a desk way more than I like to, but to throw on my bags and go out there, throw on a, a you know, my high vis and my hard hat. You don't see that from owners of companies on, mm -hmm. on our scale of, you know, uh, of Not having exactly when you're working on, you know, a, a six man framing crew and your boss is, you know, your lead, you see it. But when you're on the scale and doing the magnitude or the type of projects that we do, you don't see your boss come out, show up early, bring coffee for everyone, coffee and donuts, have our safety meetings in the morning, our toolbox check, and then throw bags on and get going. Like you don't see that that often. And so I take off, I take PTO days and I'll just go pop up on people's sites. So that's, I think that, that pushed me and helped me grow and, and get that respect and, and kind of take me to the next level, whether that was in a family business or whether that would be working for someone else, you know, you, you, you get what you put in. You know, to, to jump back onto what you were saying about employees that go above and beyond without being treated, I guess you could say the people that will dance for money won't do it when they're not being rewarded. So if it takes you throwing them extra money right then and there, that's not their drive showing. That's not their willingness to put in the work. That's just being rewarded instantly, right? It's, it's the people that need to be rewarded that are doing it without being asked, like you were saying, that really stand out. Yeah. And that's a good way to keep employee retention is following up on that, you know, setting those goals. So I do all of our employee reviews. Uh, I do the hiring, firing, wage setting. I was doing wage setting for uh, managerial positions last night. Um, and so, you know, setting those goals and it's not once a year, like it's not, my review periods come randomly because I ask for feedback on employees randomly from PMs. Oh, this guy's stellar right now. He's kicking ass over here. Like he's great. I'm going to reward him before typically when folks would do it once a year. Oh, here's mm -hmm. another buck. Like, you know, you're going to get another buck every year. So I work any harder. I'm going to come pop up and this guy who's busting his butt, he's going to get, you know, Hey, here's another buck 50 in three months from when you were hired, good job, keep it up. So yeah. following up on the, on, on the folks that are going above and beyond is crucial. Mm -hmm. And as a business owner, a lead, and it doesn't even have to be from a, a wage standpoint, um, gratification uh, and thanks goes a very long way. And it definitely does. Yeah. So uh, one thing, no offense to my father, 
um, at, at all. Um, he's a great guy and he always held me to a high standard, but there was never a lot of like good jobs. Right. And so I kept working harder and harder to get those good jobs, but that didn't happen. Folks, yeah. When folks that, you know, with, with our folks here, they're not, they're, I'm not their father. I'm not their uncle. Well, some I am, I guess, but I, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I'm not family with them. So they don't understand that, uh, that love relationship that is kind of tough love. Um, so that gratification, the thank yous, the thank you goes so far. Good mm -hmm. job. That's beautiful. The, the, the easiest things to say mean the most. Yes. And it feels people. good as an owner yeah. too, to 100%. give gratitude to the yep. people working with you. Yep. It's more encouraging than tell, telling someone to like clean up their act or do whatever. That's right. not motivating to anyone. If anything, they want to do completely the opposite after that. Yeah. And I have had those tough conversations with employees. Like, look, man, you like, have to, yeah. You, there's no reason to be in the Porter John for 30 minutes every two hours. I know you're watching YouTube. <laughs> What's the deal? Like, how do I get God dang it, Matt? Or watching Matt Bangs Wood in the <laughs> Like, you know, what, what do you, what do you, how can I help you yeah. become better? Like, my yeah. goal is not to only get production out of you. I want you to be better. I want to set you up for life. I want you to build softeners. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so it, yeah. it, it, there's those conversations I have to have in there. And I've taken that difference of demeanor of like, you need to stop to how can I help you change? Like, how can I help you see the importance of it, investing in yourself? We've, we've touched on it a lot on the podcast here, but like mental health is such a big thing. Yeah. I've, I've had people tell me I'm proud of you. And it just, it stuns me for a second. I'm like, holy shit. Like, are you really? And yeah. it doesn't matter who it comes from. Like, I, I love telling people that they're doing a good job if they're doing a good job, not, yeah. not work related, just in general. Like I, I check up on all of my close friends always and reward people. I mean, it, it's awesome to see other people doing well. And when you tell them anything positive, most people aren't used to hearing it. Yeah. Proud is one of the biggest ones that I find when you have a leadership role uh, and you have a team working uh, and growing. Um, you know, to be proud of them is, is a very strong emotion. And if you feel it, you should let them know, you know, uh, I think what a lot of people lack though, is someone in your position, for instance, they see themselves as like, oh, I'm managing 16 different projects. I have all this money coming in. This guy has one little crew like that. And they don't see a reason to praise, but every single person has a different load of stress on their mind mm -hmm. and while you might be stressing on 16 projects he's stressing on like holy shit we just screwed up a bit we need to fix it now mm -hmm. like everybody has this everybody's different in a sense on what they're carrying yeah and i think that's the hardest thing for most people to understand yeah and, and the other thing is is like everybody's got a home life like yeah you might see them for eight and a half hours a day right but the other you know eight 24 less the eight and a half they're there What's going on in their home life? Like how's yeah. it affecting their uh, their mood, their production, their uh, drive? Right? How how can you help? You know, are, are you having you know financial troubles? Are you having you know marital problems? Like how can I help you focus on being the best you, which is in turn going to help us as a company produce the best work? Absolutely. So, yeah. And I, I think that's a tough one for a lot of people to accept too, because oftentimes it's like leave your leave your shit at home, like don't don't bring it to the job site. But it's like at the end of the day while you want them to treat this like their life, they still have a life outside of it. So understanding what's going on is definitely key. Yeah. And I, I, I'm very much, I'm an emotional guy. Like not that I go home and cry, but, um, I have a tattoo, uh, on my, on my arm, on my, uh, wrist. Uh, it's a heart because I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, uh, and so like, clever man with words here we go <laughs> and so like that to me is like i care so much or i have so much and you can see my emotion like you can mm -hmm. see my passion like when i get around a bunch of inspirational folks like i'm stoked i'm excited like i can't sleep i'm so excited to be a part of this or i can't wait to wake you know try and sleep and then wake up to do this and and keep working on that and there's uh, you know, other, other people wear their heart on their sleeve in both positive and negative aspects too. And, and they bring that to work, whether you hope it's checked at, at you know, the start of your day or not, it, it happens. You know, people lose family members. Uh, people are having trouble with their girlfriend or boyfriend. People uh, just lost their grandma, you know, things like that. It, it weighs on people and to care about someone personally will help you in a professional sense. 
Absolutely. Um, I think Matt, Matt, you back? All right, cool. We I'm back. I'm having technique. some trouble. My house is You're too back. far away. House is too far away from the shop. Um, we're 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 back though. We we're just gonna jump right back in. Let's do it, baby. We're rolling. Let's let's do it. So with family run businesses, I, I come from one myself. Uh, a lot of things can change over the years. The workforce, technology, how people work. Um, I took us from fully on paper writing out numbers and shit to like. <laughs> Now everything's automated. I haven't signed anything in years. I'm curious to ask you, what are you doing now that was different from the way that your dad was running the business? And are there any foreseeable changes that you feel like you're going to make? Yeah, I have this, uh, I have this concept of hit, it's, uh, I call it hit by a bus. Um, if someone were to be hit by a bus, can you pick up where they cannot, right? So what do you need to store digitally? What do you need to transcribe? What's your standard operating procedure? Um, I have a biz business development manager, uh, Melinda. She is awesome. Uh, she has created so many SOPs for us on simple things that may pertain to one person's expertise. But if that person were to get hit by a bus, can you pick up that SOP and continue on and do their job and make sure that everyone who's here still has a job? And yeah. our work stays flowing. So, um, you know, uh, putting everything digital, uh, takeoffs wise, I still wheel and I handwrite. Um, I, I go out, I wheel. Do you really? Yep. Everything. And we're talking by the, by the millions of square foot of siding. No, I know you're on a massive scale. I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah. I hand, I, I, I wheel everything, put it all down by hand and then I put it digitally. Um, and our, it's kind of tough. Like I can't use blue beam because, um, blue beam it's, it's kind of made for new construction and blank canvas. We deal with yeah. existing structures. So it's really hard to say like, you know, you're working with owner occupied people still live there while we're doing the work. You have to deal with restricted hours. You have to deal with restricted access. You can't park here. You can't store a container here. You can't drop materials here. So all of that has to get factored in during our bidding process. So a lot of the stuff that I do, I create our own, uh, it's, it's kind of standardized based on, you know, the materials and the installations, but then I have to factor in a different multiplier or, um, basically how hard something's going to be or how easy something's going to be. So all of that's by hand initially from the initial RFP request for proposal, the bid walk, then I go wheel take all my notes, every single light fixture, window size, operation, tempered, not door, handing, swinging, boring, uh, square foot of siding, lineal foot of trim, head flashings, diverters, everything. I do it all by hand. And then I put it on Excel forms. So Sean, if I get hit by a bus, Sean, my father can literally take all of my takeoffs and start crunching numbers from there. So, you know what, though? In, in your case, it makes sense, though. The more I'm thinking about, I've been sitting here pondering this for the last 60 seconds. With you guys doing a lot of existing structures, it does make sense that you do have to get out there and do everything in person. Because yep. I, I was just sitting here thinking about it. I'm like, shit, I could go online right now and flip through like every house I've built. But the difference is it's new construction. So that makes complete sense. Yep. Like, that, your, that, like your plans, you can go send to your lumber vendor. They'll look at your plans and they'll have a waste factor of 10 or 10 or 5%. And they yeah. can send you your truss pack, your wall studs, your sheeting. They have all that, but I'm uncovering siding. I don't know how many sheets of half inch CDX I need yet because what's, what's rotten, what's I, not exactly. I don't know the damage, but I do know yeah. all my quantity, uh, the quantities of, of square foot. I put in waste factor, linear foot of trim, things like that. So I, I can kind of uh, I can kind of make it easier, but kind of not, but back from back in the, so my dad knowing Arabic first and having the worst handwriting in English, you couldn't pick up any of his takeoff notes and read it. Nobody. <laughs> in this world I love that old school writing. You can't yeah. read shit. No, none of it. And mine's just as bad. So as soon as you do wheel and have all your information, you put it directly onto the computer. And so all of our timekeeping for all of our employees is on T sheets. Um, all yep, of our, I've used uh, that. Yep. So we use T sheets, we use Procore, um, we use smart, uh, uh, smart sheet, SharePoint, uh, a lot of office uh, 365, um, even our, our communication, uh, company, cell phones, company, you know, vehicles, there's a lot of things that we used to have that we do now that makes it easier to operate as a company. Um, but I think the, one of the biggest things is our marketing sense. So we don't market mm -hmm. because it's all word of mouth and there's specialty contractors. We're kind of a niche market. Um, but 
you have to stay in front of the people who are HOA managers, community managers, or apartment portfolio managers, uh, or lawyers who represent HOA communities, or um, you know, uh, consultants, architects, engineers. You have to stay in front of them because they are the folks that either have the communities in distress or that have the, uh, are curating the scopes, plans, and details for a project that's coming up. So that's something we've changed, and Melinda does that as well. Uh, she does business development and marketing. And it's really fun. Um, you know, I speak at a lot more. Uh, I, I, I do a lot of trade shows and speak at them for construction. Um, and so I, I, I have to be in front of people a lot more. So I have to smile a lot more. Um, but uh, that's kind of different from what we used to do. Um, just how we have to keep up with the folks that bring business our way. Uh, You're essentially so, putting, putting yourself out there a little bit more now. Yeah. And we don't have billboards. We don't uh, target ad market, none of that stuff. But it's really amongst the client group that we have, the community management companies that are uh, in our local areas, uh, you know, holiday baskets, uh, take them to lunch, you know, at, be on beck and call for them, answer to their leaky window on a Saturday at 10 p.m. Our crews are out there tarping that roof or tarping that window or whatever, um, you know, so that that sort of thing is a little different than how we used to do it. We also yeah. need to be specific to single family residences. So you had one client, one person cut the check, one person reviewed the invoice, and it was simple. Now we have an HOA board, we have a third party consultant, we have their lawyer. Um, and so there's a lot of checks and balances and, and it's, it takes a lot longer to go through the payment process. Uh, and there's a lot more, you know, project closeout binders, uh, product warranties, things like that, that you have to produce. So it's just evolving with how construction is. And with, think, with, the, with the more that you do, though, as far as having like the HOA and the lawyers and stuff, the, the bigger the checks are. So, I mean, it, it offsets a bit, I'm sure. I, I'm not retiring anytime soon. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> quick, quick question for you, too. Being 29. Family <laughs> owned and operated. Um, do you have kids or do you plan to have kids? I mean, obviously, you've got to pass this down, right? I'm going to defer that question to my wife and I'll let you argue with her. <laughs> there we go. Um, and no, I'll, so I'll defer you to my Breck and Breck can argue for me. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's kind of interesting. So with the whole pandemic thing, like whether you believe in it or not, none of my business, whether it affects your business or not, yeah. whatever, but we're in one, whether you believe in it, however you business. hash it out. Yeah, exactly. So my wife and I had travel plans to go do a bunch of things. We actually met, we, I've known her for like nine years. She hated me for the first three. And then I kind of matured a little bit and we started dating. Um, we did 77 days around the world, living out of backpacks while we were dating. And I told her before we left, I said, if we make it through this and we're still dating, when we get home, I'm going to ask you to marry me in Hawaii on the 4th of July. She goes, that's super unromantic. Like you just told me everything. I was like, no, this is our goal. Like, so we did a bunch of traveling and that's what we love to do. We love to go see new places. We did uh, 26 countries, 29 cities for the world wonders. Wow. Um, yeah. That's um, amazing. Living, living in hostels. So traveling's our thing. We, we have postponed travel to New Zealand that we want to do. We're supposed to go to Mozambique for two years now, but we can't go because of COVID, things like that. So um, we probably would have already started trying to have kids. Um, but we had that trip been through. Yeah. We have yeah, life events yeah. that we have on hold. So we're two years behind now. So, um, it'll happen. I don't doubt it. I want three kids. She wants to, um, we'll see how it goes, but yeah, it, in, I'm not going to push my children to, to want to be into the family business. They'll have every opportunity to, and I'll treat it very, uh, very similar to how my father and mother did. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't want to push someone into something and have them regret doing it or have, uh, have a negative aspect. Well, I have to do this because it's a family. You know, yeah. Should I could sell this thing and, and retire? Uh, or, or you can same conversation my dad had with me, or you can bust your butt, get to work, figure it out, learn and, and, and grow and, and you can be a part of it. So yeah, we'll have kids eventually, but when that's the argument conversation. <laughs> Jumping back on that for just a second, what did you go to college for? Oh man, fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the second second podcast you in got a row. master's very in fun. answer yeah yeah. Um, yeah what did i go to college for so it's kind of funny um this was another like where my father like kind of set me straight i started at oregon state in their engineering program i tested out of college math uh as a freshman when i first showed up so all of my Holy crap. engineering trig yeah I'm, uh man hand cutting rafters cutting stairs like in any sort of degree or angle that's my thing 
Numbers. Uh, yeah, numbers are my thing. And that's why I do numbers now, estimating things. I can literally drive through a community and say, this is going to be this project. And I'm probably within $100,000, which may seem like a lot, but that comes down to like maybe five to 10% on these projects. Um, you know, I can drive through a community and be that close on numbers. But back to college. So I started in the engineering program uh, and I wanted to be, uh, wanted to finish with my construction engineering management degree. And I went through two years of that. One of the folks that I work with, I had dinner with him last night. He's an architect uh, and engineer. Um, he said, he was one of my professors in the engineering program at Oregon State. Um, and one winter break, I went home and my dad's like, so how's the program going? Like, yeah, it's great. And I said, yeah, like this engineering thing's really going to work out. Like I'm really good at numbers. I understand it. We're starting to CAD, like it's cool. And he goes, that's great. I can't wait to hire you to be an engineer. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, 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 I'll hire you all the time. And I was like, okay, this is a learning lesson. Talk to me like I'm an idiot. He goes, I hire engineers. I don't hire business owners. I hire engineers. And I was like, got it. Switch to a business degree that next term. So <laughs> yeah, it's so I, I understand the numbers. I, you know, I can't, I can't draft. I'm not good at that stuff. I, but I have great team members who are. But uh, so uh, business, uh, business management was my degree and a second degree in arts and letters communications, how to talk to people from different uh, facets and walks of life. So um, I learned how to speak to people and essentially how to sell to people who come from all different backgrounds, different religion, race, uh, geographic location, things like that. So I can talk to a room full of people coming from not where I'm from, you know, coming from uh, living in multifamily, coming from California, uh, living in Utah, uh, you know, different political views, religious views, things like that, and have that common understanding and respect. And, and I was taught that in college, and it seems like a silly degree, but I actually did learn how kind of not to be an asshole or not to put my foot in my mouth. So that degree does help out every now and again. Love that. I believe it. That That's something a lot of people have trouble with is the communication yeah. part of things. Yeah. In construction alone. I mean, there's a lot of people who are really great craftsmen and craftswomen, but they cannot talk to people. They couldn't Most sell the really room. great craftsmen are also very large assholes. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the truth. I've, I've forgotten more than you'll ever learn. And... I've heard that one <laughs> a million times. The way that we've always done it. Uh, Marcus, uh, I, I know the next generation is something that definitely matters to you. Mm -hmm. um, you actively take initiative, whether it's hands-on training, developing, and uh, excuse me, developing your internship program. Tell us a little bit more about how you guys are going about investing in the upcoming generation. Yeah. So um, as I grow with this company, I have 30 more years. Um, you know, I would love to retire and go live on a ranch and not have neighbors, but it's just not my case. So I have to treat this company like I am here every single day for the next 30 years minimum. Uh, and then I'll advise for my children, whoever it's passed down to. In that, I have to understand who's my workforce. Who are the going to fill the 100 spots that I have on payroll right now in 15 years? And so the way that I've started to approach this is by starting to work with schools pre-college. So uh, we have an internship program at Gorse Construction. It's called Grow with Gorse. Um, and we bring on- That's, that's branded nicely, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so Grow with Gorse brings on high school students, uh, 16, 17, and 18 years old. And they're typically from our local high schools uh, who have a construction program. I had to get, I had to get additional insurance. I had to have them on our job sites. Uh, they can only work with certain power tools. Bureau of Labor and Industry signed off on them working with impacts, uh, but they can't use any corded saws, no skill saws, no battery powered saws. Uh, so I went, jumped through all these hoops to basically get students on site to determine if they like construction or not. And this is kind of their stepping stone of you know, going from in classroom or in trade school learning to actually being in the elements around other people who have more knowledge than them and determining if this is a career path for them or something they want to go into. And so we bring on 10 interns every summer. We start them right after the 4th of July. So they get kind of like three, four weeks off from school and they run from beginning of July until end of August. And so it's a six or eight week program, depending on how the year falls. And we check in with them, we train them, we pair them up, but I have people who this is their first job and I'm putting them on scaffolding and pump jacks and on mm -hmm. huge projects and they're learning. They're actually taking what their instructor in their course has taught them. And so we is this paid internship to oh, yeah. Marcus. Yeah. 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 Uh, paid I had to learn. 
handsomely too. Um, yeah. Labor's not getting cheap. Um, I think our last round of interns were, uh, I think like 16, 50 an hour, which is not bad for knowing absolutely nothing and having no tools. No. So yeah. The, so um, I bring them on, uh, teach them, train them. Uh, I had got all the additional insurance. So I do that every summer. And the goal with that is to possibly give someone the opportunity to determine, I don't want to go to college because schooling's not for me. And I want uh, to get into the trades and I've had the experience, whether that be, I need more on the job hours to go into an electrical apprenticeship, or I want to go into the union and be a pipe fitter, or I want to go into this trade, continue to use me, continue to use me to leverage your career path, however that so be. Um, and I'm working with an extremely large corporation right now on sponsoring uh, construction management college courses. So you have to go through two years of high school internship, and then we're selecting out of that pool annually five students to get college paid for maintaining a certain GPA and working. Wow. For mm -hmm. That's so, awesome, man. Yeah. So we're working on that. Um, and that's going to be my workforce. So it, like logistically or, 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 or in, in figures, right? 10 students every year. Let's say I started this year. That's 10 students. If I retain half of them, that's five students that come back next summer and an additional 10 this summer, brand new. And then let's say two of those five go to the college program. The other two go somewhere else. And one of them comes on full time. I've retained one employee from giving them an opportunity. And then I've retained two more who are going to college and working full-time at Gores. And then it just a continuous cycle of feeding labor into Gores instruction while giving some folks the opportunity to determine what is going to be the best option for them without having to go into tens of thousands of dollars in debt. So absolutely. And so that's, that's how I've structured this. And it's like, it, it's just a growing, it's a snowball effect of people that will come on without having to send out hiring ads and setting up full days of my schedule every 30 minutes, uh, interviews of folks who won't show up or need to continue to apply, but don't show up to the interviews to stay on their unemployment plan or things like that. So I get that a lot. We'll carve out a full day of me being in office ready for people. And uh, for example, I did a hiring push in September. I scheduled like 48 interviews, five or eight showed up, five passed our criteria of no felonies and can pass a drug test. And I hired all of them. So do the math on that. Mm -hmm. That is terrible, terrible um, return on, on scheduling, on time, on financial investment, on going out and target market. A lot of your, your time wasted. 100%. So the better way for me to do that is to work with schools directly and just bring on 10 people and bring on 10 more the next year and bring on and bring on and give them a home, give them a place to be and pay them well to, to retain them. So to, to touch on that real quick, kids are a lot more innocent than grown adults as well. So what you're going to get with people that are applying is a lot of lying, um, telling you they're better than they are. Yep. And they're really not. Yep. Kids will flat out tell you that they don't have any experience and that they need to grow. On top of that, though, I really like what you're doing because oftentimes the majority of people we talk to do the opposite. They go to college first, realize, holy oh, shit, I don't like this. Never There's thousands in debt. <laughs> and then they go back to a trades career. And it's like, that is, that's ass backwards. Start with the one that has less risk. Yep. Go try a trade. You're not going to be invested $50,000. You're getting paid exactly. You're getting paid to work. If you don't like it, go to college, yep. figure out what you want to do from there. And it's always the other way around. It's always college first, spend your money, drop out, and then they swing a hammer. It and never makes any sense to me, but dad. yeah, it's, it's what we've told them for the longest time is normal. Yeah. And so we do that. Um, and I also, on one of our trade schools, uh, Sabin Schellenberg, I sit on their construction curriculum board. Um, so I help dictate with a couple other industry partners. Um, uh, one of the other uh, huge commercial high rise uh, companies has one of their estimators sit on the board. And then there's a union uh, rep that sits on the board and helps develop the curriculum. So they're not in their building birdhouses. They're actually- That's good. Yeah. So um, I sit on that board and it's kind of cool because this trade school, I went there when I was in high school. Um, there's three high schools, local high schools that filter into this one trade school. You bus there uh, for a two period uh, term and then go back to your high school for the rest of your math, health, uh, sex ed, whatever. Right. Um, and uh, so you get hands on learning. I took welding there. They didn't have construction when I was there and now they do. So um, we help create their curriculum. We sponsor their events. Uh, I, I have a, three full-time employees that came directly from there. 
uh, and I've been on that board for two years. So my invested time in that is going to turn workforce into future for me. Um, so that's just, that's one of the many things we do um, with trying to retain employees, bring on new folks. And I love, 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 love hiring people who know nothing. That's the it easiest sounds, way to do it. You can it mold sounds them. Awesome. It's the hardest to unteach people bad habits. Yep. The hardest thing to do. Old dog, new tricks, not going to work. I love grabbing. So one of our project facilitators managed Starbucks. I and remember guy, you telling me about this. Yeah, I love this. This guy's, this guy's awesome. Okay. He came to us. He says, I just want to work with my hands. He goes, I know nothing. I'll take minimum wage. He's like, I don't pay any of my people minimum wage. I'll start you at our starting rate. But, uh, and then he was like, oh, great. Uh, oh, we're running low on this material and letting his PMs know, hey, we're going to run out. You need to order or, oh, hey, I noticed this person wasn't here. You need to send that in. And I was like, that's that Starbucks management. Yes. And so I took that and I said, I'm getting you out of bags ASAP and you're facilitating projects. You're helping material order, inventory. Uh, time management, um, uh, meeting minutes and agendas on our OAC meetings, you know, things like that. And he's kicking ass. He's getting That's a company awesome. vehicle. He gets a company vehicle next week. Uh, he's a salaried position. He went from 18 bucks an hour to salary p- position in two and a half years. Yep. Jeez, Didn't have yes. a Starbucks truck. Yep. <laughs> so I love grabbing people that know nothing or come from a completely different background. So I, I had a, I had a quick question. Um, so for the students, the 16, 17, and 18 year olds that are going through the, the internship that you guys have, do most of them go off to trade school after that? Like, or would they go directly into the business or like, what, what does that kind of uh, uh, trajectory yeah. look like for those kids? So, um, or are they getting sufficient training by working at Goris? So they're getting sufficient training uh, at Gorse within the realm of what they're allowed to use, right? Okay. So they're not going to be pinning up siding because they can't use air compressed nail guns. Uh, they're not going to be fixing mass amounts of dry out unless they're hand banging everything. So mm-hmm. um, it's kind of tough uh, to really give them like actual trade knowledge, but they understand how a site works. They understand respect. They understand punctuality. And a lot of times this is their first job. Okay. Mm-hmm. So teaching them to wake up early is not, a, is, is it's new to them, teaching them to be dependable and accountable, holding them accountable. So they do get those skills on basic employment, as well as some construction skills within the realm that I have to follow for Bureau of Labor and Industry. Now, the difference is, is in, in the retention rate, I guess, if you were to look at their uh, trajectory and their outcome after the internship, I keep in touch with them. I go speak at their schools. Uh, I draft their curriculum with their instructor. Um, but what comes of it is they find out I want to be an electrician. So mm-hmm. I need more on the job hours. So they'll come work for another six months, get all their on the job hours and go into an apprenticeship. Or, and then they'll go deal with that and go through there. I do get some retention from it. And, and it's really fun to see them hit that 18 years old uh, because it's like free range, like all the tools. Now you're really going to learn. Yeah, yeah. You have a great core core framework to work off of. Um, so they, they are getting a lot of learning while here. And a lot of it is how to be a good uh, employee for a company. So whether that goes to somewhere else, I don't mind. Um, and whether that goes into a union, I don't mind. We're a non-union shop. Um, and it, it, it's, you know, it is what it is. The instructor at that trade school I sit on the curriculum board, she is a, a huge advocate of uh, unions. Uh, she was in one uh, actively uh, as a carpenter, um, and and I have nothing bad to say about it. Um, and it's it's interesting um, that the, a lot of those students think union is the only way to go after that. So I kind of break that mold um, by going to non-union shops and go learning like, wow, there is a career here, or wow, like I can learn a lot of things, or I'm not stuck to only this trade. I can cross train. Um, you know, I can learn deck coatings and I can learn rough framing. I don't know too many rough framers that are also Masons or fluid applied WRB applicators or yep. that window installers or steel stud framing and things like that. So Often, yeah, kind of like we touched on earlier in the, actually before the podcast is being yeah. like the ability to do multiple things. Yeah. And on, I kind of interrupted you there. Yeah, no, no worries. So it's it, the, the retention aspect has happened. Not as great as I'd like it to, but they do go on typically to either apprenticeships or other construction jobs, whether that be their family business or things like that. Because when they were 16, 17, they couldn't go work at their family business unless it was so small, they didn't have OSHA breathing down their neck. Yep. 
So, you know, they couldn't go run nail guns. They couldn't go run chop saws, skill saws, things like that. Um, so, uh, like I have one guy, Garrett, he went to go work for his dad. Who's a rough framer. Great. I gave him all the opportunity. I paid him and he wants to take over his dad's company. Now, um, Alan Camacho is going to, uh, his electrical apprenticeship. He left, uh, employment at Gorse construction on the 30th of December. And I'm super sad to see him go because we trained him so well. And he was a stellar guy, but I can't stop him from chasing his dream. Like go, go do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Go do what, what your goals and aspirations are. Um, so whether it's at Gorse construction, I had that retention or in the construction industry, all truly all I care about, cause I'm going to need electricians. I'm going to need HVAC yeah. contractors. Yeah. I'm going to need concrete guys, flat work guys. Um, you're going to need those folks. So does it, I don't think in a, I don't have a closed mindset on like, Oh, these are my guys. I got to keep my guys or the, mm-hmm. these are our crews. They need to stay here forever. It's not how I treat it. And, and I don't, and it hasn't been like that, but I have retained some folks but they're also going to other trades that are going to benefit Gorse Construction at some point, whether that's truly their company or whether that's just the workforce in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. As a whole, though, you know you're bettering the industry rather than 100%. taking away from it. It's whether so you're investing in your own business or investing into your future subcontractors. I like that. And more. not only that, with the, with the people that you will retain, they know yep. that they have the ability to go on later on and do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. So they're going to take their job very seriously working for you, knowing that you're giving them that option. One of the first um, questions or one of the, after I uh, put a conditional job offer on the table for anyone I interview, uh, one of the first bits of advice is I ask someone a question to say, is this a job or is this a career for you? And that will tell you right now how much time I'm willing to invest in you in training, further education, and growth. If this is a clock in, clock out for you, you're going to be a busy bee. If you want to take my spot, come take it. It's yours. Trust me. But you want to, you have to have that mindset of I'm going to make a career out of this, or I'm going to go into this industry, or this is something I just need a paycheck. I just, I had yeah. bills, you know, so that's one of the first things I ask folks after I slide that conditional job offer across the table. So it, it's, it's once just you, once you know what their goals are, you know, how much you're willing to put into them. Cause you're not going to invest mm-hmm. so much time into somebody that literally just wants a job for the summer. Yep. We, we've but, had a lot of people hit us up asking if they could fill time until the union hires them back. And it's like, yeah, that's cool. But we're not going to give you the time as, as we would like with an apprentice. Yep. We can't give that time because we're not going to get it back. Yep. And it's kind of funny, like I've had crew members who this was only a job for them. And then I've had one conversation that kind of flipped a light switch for them. And they're the next day, it's now a career. And you can see how much differently they act. And it's super- oh, the cool. way they hold themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Kyle Martin, uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite guys, just a goofy guy. Uh, I had a conversation with him like a year and a half ago. I was like, and I, I quoted that, that JFK quote. And, and cause something he said to me, he goes, well, I don't get paid enough to do that. And I said, you'll never get paid enough to do that if you don't do it. Yeah. Mm. And he's like, what? And I was like, it's not what you can do. It's not what the company can do for you. It's what you can do for the company. And, Absolutely. and so how do, you, day, how do you bring value to the table? It, yeah. It, the, the next day it was lights out. Like the guy was everywhere. Just production just doubled. Like he was a hard worker. And I was like, there you go. Here's your raise. Like, yep. Sometimes it's just a little perspective change. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of, I see that flip around like age 24 and guys. 25 That's over here. happened for me a <laughs> couple years back. Happy birthday, Matt. <laughs> Up until then it was fuck this shit. I'm here for a paycheck. And then it was like, no, nah, this is bigger than that. Yep. No, yep. once you realize it's a marathon, then you got to make the change. Totally. Um, Marcus, we got two more questions before we go into the fast five. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up is, I mean, you guys came in hot on hammer mm. i've noticed five to ten uh so people from gore's construction the crew uh mm. have joined hammer on the app and everything um we had briefly talked about this uh in our previous conversation that we had chatted uh maybe a month or so ago mm. um, but as one running the show for for the company how do you see hammer helping your business and some of your recruiting efforts oh this is a problem Homo deal here. I see what we're th- doing. Th- th- this, this was, I mean, they came in heavy. I, I got to hear it from the guy. So we it's, go. it's really cool. Like I, I've commented, so I have my own account and it's kind of interesting because um, the way I understand it is like people who are in the trade and actively working, showcasing what they're passionate about and the work that they're performing. And mine would be taking pictures of buildings I'm wheeling or numbers I'm crunching. So it's not that fun, but I do highlight uh, 
the projects we work on and I'll go take photos on sites while I'm there and update the projects that I have on Hammer. But how I see it is, um, you know, first, uh, individually, it, it, it shows people to take pride in their work. Like if they want to showcase it, they're going to make it look good, right? Yeah. Um, they're going to make sure that what they're putting together is awesome. Uh, from an owner's perspective, um, how I see it is I, I start to understand different building practices and how people are doing it in other places without having to go there. Right. So for example, I saw a gentleman's post and I, I think he was a, a VP or, or president of a company, um, a, a window installing company. And he posted some windows that he had installed. And from my building science background and my, you know, I'm a 2400, my high performance installation from uh, Fortifiber Henry's Corp uh, understanding of installing windows the right way. I looked at him and I was like, this guy's installing windows the right way. I, w it, I would never have to fix his work. That is amazing to see. Good building practices. And it's really cool to check on and see kind of what everybody else is doing. And I really love, I really love finish work because I don't get to deal with it that much. And I'm not good at it. I'm a rough framer by trade. And uh, rough framers typically don't end up being finished carpenters. Uh, no. some, are, some are and some are really good at it. But me, I, I'm, you know. I'm, I'm swinging 16 penny and, and my stiletto is worn down. So um, it, it's getting to see someone's finish work is so awesome. So just getting ideas and inspiration from other folks is really cool. Um, as a business owner and in uh, it, it, understanding the app and its future functions and its current functions, um, understanding that this is essentially a labor pool of people. Um, this is a pool of people who uh, may be happy uh, may not be happy, uh, may be looking for other work or get into a different aspect of the trade still in construction. And we offer any position, all positions every single day of the year at Gorse Construction. So at some point when Hammer turns, I see this as an opportunity to bring on people to make sure that they're happy with their career. Um, maybe going from owning a business and not wanting to anymore uh, to you know running crews here. Um, or, you know, getting that one guy who can't find a job and posts it out there says, Hey, I'm good at X, Y, and Z. Um, here's my credentials. Here's some of the work that I've done. And me saying, great, uh, you're in Portland Metro area, or you're in Salt Lake, or you're in Southwest Washington. Um, here's our projects. Here's what we got. And here's, here's what we're offering as a role. If you want to come to work, come in an interview. So there's an opportunity for business owners to utilize this at some point. Um, right now, I get inspiration and I see a lot of pride and, and that's really fun to see. Um, so that, that's how I see it currently. Yeah. So one I, thing I, have that, a, I have, I have real, real quick. I have a okay, question to it. ask you and, and kind of, I need to figure out how to structure this. Basically it's going to tell me if people are on offense or defense as a business owner, you're not worried. You, you see more of a I was benefit. Ask this too. You see more of a benefit of being on hammer because you could potentially pull from that labor pool as opposed to your employees being on there worried that they're going to be snatched. So therefore there's you're, no better place to work. Yeah. There's you're no confident better place to work in the workplace stuff. you're giving. Therefore you don't have a problem with that. No. So obviously um, the people that are worried about it are lesser or not giving their employees as much. Yeah. So the difference is, um, and, and I'll reiterate, um, and this may be boisterous, but I truly believe this in my heart. There's no better place to work than Gorse Construction in where we work, because there's no one that is going to know your name. You're a lot of places that are in the size of construction and the size of projects we have, you're a number uh, or you're a paycheck or you're an expense, right? So a lot of people look at their uh, labor pool as expense and how do they create enough profit to offset that expense and make some money along the way. Yeah. Me, uh, and us here at Gorse, uh, we understand that the expense that goes into employees will turn a profit eventually. Um, and not every job is as profitable as the others. Not every employee is as profitable as others. Um, but that's not a function I look at. I look at good culture. I look at great, uh, great benefits. Uh, I look at good pay, reasonable pay, living wages, um, longevity. And it shows in our, in our retention and how long-term uh, of employees we have. Uh, one of my PMs here has been with Gorse Construction, was the first hire in 1998. So wow. I have Masons who inst are installing stucco in the Pearl District of Portland. We've been here 17 years, 15 years regularly. And that loyalty and that longevity in employment speaks volumes that I know if I lose employees, 
it's because of their personal reasons, not because of the workplace that we provide. So I know if, if you have it in your mind to create a career here, you have every single opportunity. Mm -hmm. You are treated fairly, if not more than fair, um, employee appreciation, healthcare benefits, PTO. Uh, we had a week of snow, uh, in between, uh, Christmas and new year's. Uh, would you pay your guys, your hourly guys, if they weren't swinging hammer on a job, a lot of people would say, no, I yeah. pay everyone. We had fires a year and a half ago in the summer. We had a week off due to air pollution. I paid everyone. Um, I know that people live off of their earnings and a lot of people are focused solely on numbers and profitability that they don't, they end up losing their labor force because they don't take a personal aspect to their crews. So I know in my heart that the folks that are going to leave Gorse Construction are either going to better themselves or just aren't the right fit. But the long-term employees that we have, the long-term crew members, PMs, people that started here with bags on are now in company trucks that grow, they have every opportunity and I will do everything I need to do to sell more work, bring on more people, uh, make sure everyone's taken care of and happy working here. So I don't see it as a threat to us as a business. And 100% people can, but those are the folks that they may need to pay their people a little better, or they may need to look at how they structure their uh, bonuses or their, um, you know, their healthcare coverage or things like that. So, you know, those things that we are able to do and that we take out of our bottom line to make sure that people are, uh, have a comfortable place to work uh, is, what it, it is what is retained. And it takes a smart employee to understand that. A lot of people will chase a buck more here or there, yeah. but, but don't understand that you know, per employee, the healthcare per employee cost me about $7,000 a year, okay? That's more than a buck more, that's $2 an hour. So you're gonna leave me with healthcare to go get another dollar an hour for no healthcare? Yeah. You just lost money on your transfer. But I, yeah, I exactly. Teach, I'm not going to teach that. It's not my not job. Every, not everybody has that mindset either to think in that. Yep. And the, the, the thing is I have, I have, and I stick to my guns on this. If you leave me, I'm never offering you another job. Really? Yep. Shit. Elaborate. Uh, I've had folks, it's kind of funny. Um, uh, one of my buddies, uh, came to work for us and I put him through additional training. Uh, he borrowed my tool bags for his first month here while he got a few paychecks in and could buy his own tools. And he worked and worked and worked. And he went from laborer to carpenter helper to window setter really quick. And he was good at it, but he wanted to go do a job to where he could make more money by working more hours. And I don't mm. offer more hours. We work on owner occupied. They don't let us bang on their buildings on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah. They don't let us bang on their building till sundown. It's 7.30 to four, Monday to Friday. That's the restrictions we work in. So he wanted to go make more money uh, by working more hours, longer hours and strain his body. He reached out to one of our other common friends who's a PM for me and said, hey, this guy wants would, would come back to work, but he wants uh, a lead role. And he said he'd want a, a company vehicle. And I said, none of that even matters to me because he didn't have faith in me and the, the guide, the guideline and the roadmap I had for him in his career, because mm -hmm. I looked at him as having a career here. He didn't have faith in my long, uh, my long-term plan for him to stay over a year. What makes me want to increase his benefits and bring him back knowing he'll probably leave in another year to go and chase that dollar again. Most people don't look past their nose. Exactly. So I don't rehire. That makes sense. I yeah. mean, every reason that you just gave is a perfect reason. Yep. It's, it's all it, about loyalty. If you're loyal to me, I am 10 times more loyal to you. I think what it comes down to is people trusting the process. A lot of people want short-term satisfaction and if they don't get it, it's on to the next, but losing, losing benefits and working more doesn't sound like a perk to me. No, unless you have perfect health and don't need glasses and don't need dental and you know, all these <laughs> things that, you know, I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, that's short-sighted. It's, it's a, it's, it's kind of funny. You know, I sat in my office on Monday night until about seven 30 discussing the future with one of my PMs. He's 30 years old and he wanted to let me know that he is in it for the long run. He wants to retire here. And I said, great. He said, I want to be a right-hand man. I said, great. Um, you know, I appreciate that, but you'd have to trust the process. And my door is always open. Everybody has my personal phone number, which is very rare on a, in a company of this stature. Um, you can call me if you want to talk, you can bend my ear for as long as you want. And I'm going to reassure you that you have a home. You have a consistent place to work. You have nothing to worry about. Um, you know, when people 
when people saw COVID, people were freaked out thinking we're going to have to shut down. I changed up our projects. I bumped people around in our schedule to make sure we're doing outside only work. No need to go inside of units. Make sure we could do this to make sure people had jobs. We did not slow down. We sped up during the pandemic. So it's having faith in me uh, as a business owner and, and the rest of the business owners here, my sister and my dad, uh, and, and knowing that we're going to do everything we can to make sure you have a paycheck, food on your table, benefits, and a job to show up to every morning. Well, ultimately, if your employees fail, your business is going to fail. Mm-hmm. Affects yep. the numbers somehow. They are your yeah. big asset. Absolutely. Well, we are about to close out. It's It's been awesome. Um, we've touched on a lot of things that I am stoked we touched on. I mean, you, you've talked about things from training employees to retaining employees, the many different ways that you're doing it. Um, ultimately, what it comes down to is giving them an environment that's one healthy to be in and two provides what they need to live. Yep. Um, I, I need to go out to Oregon and, and hang out with you for a little bit, but <laughs> we're, we're going to head into our fast five. I got one last question for you though. It is kind of different. Um, I would be curious to know, I know you said you're big into travel. What is one of your non-work related goals? Non-work related goals. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm an avid outdoorsman. I hunt and fish and uh, I'm working on this thing. It's called the super slam. Um, so I sit on a board for conservation for wild sheep in Oregon. I'm a life member at a lot of, you know, Rocky mountain elk foundation. Uh, I care about animals and our ability to use them as a resource for meat, um, and, uh, food and sustainability, um, you know, fishing enjoyment, um, things like that. But one of my goals is, uh, to complete my super slam and that's uh, successfully harvesting all 29 North American big game species. So, oh, shit. uh, yeah, so that's every species of elk, every species of deer, every species of sheep, every species of caribou, moose, bear, uh, etc. List goes on and on. So how I'm far actually, are you into that? I'm 17 to 29 right now, and let's you know, go. And there's a list of in the world people have done it. So about a list of 500 people. Oh wow. wow! Yeah, so not that many people have done it, and I'm you know pretty close to completing it. It'll probably take me another five six years to do it. Uh, but you have to document everything pretty thoroughly in order to make it to where yeah you have to register it so there's like 10 categories for each of them and so it's like one of the deer one of the elk one of the moose one of the cats one of the bears so when you complete one of each species it's the super 10 and that was my initial goal and i completed that in february of last year with bison in mexico um they sent a film crew down uh savage arms film uh the hunt and they used it as promotion and I'm going to accept a award for my Super 10 uh, in two weeks in Las oh, Vegas shit. at a uh, at a convention. Yeah. So, so does does your house look like a Bass Pro Shop? Uh, um, my office does. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I'll send you some photos offline of our of the game room I have. Yeah, it's please, a, please do. do. It's a it's about 6,600 square feet of of a museum. That's yeah, awesome. Just, awesome. I love that. Animals every different kinds of species yeah so that's forget that's a passion business. we're going hunting up in oregon yeah. <laughs> hunting fishing yeah it's it's that's what I, that's my recharge is being out in the woods with no one around you know just yep. testing myself mentally physically and getting after it i'm glad to hear that most people burn out if they don't do something on the side and it sounds like you've got a lot of something on the side yeah that's exactly how i recharge man get out in the trees yep yeah exactly Awesome, brother. Uh, before we wrap up our, all of our episodes, we end with our fast five. It's five questions to be answered in a sentence or less. I believe I already know the answer to number one. So we just went over it, but I was going to ask if you had to choose between hunting or fishing for the rest of your life, what would it be? Hunting. I think, yeah, that was a no brainer. Number two, Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant? Michael Jordan. Let's go, my man. Number three, favorite music artist? Ooh, uh, See, this was a good question. I knew it would be Frank Sinatra. We got DJ turntables here. Who was that? <laughs> Frank Sinatra. Old blue eyes. Did you spin him was, back in college I, I was, days? <laughs> he was dead before I was spin. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I wasn't either. That's a good one. That uh, or, or Coulter Wall right now. Like wait, it. wait, wait. Let's fall back to like the spinning days. Favorite rap artist? Mm, um, favorite rap artist? It's, it's kind of silly. It's dumb music, but I like Migos. It's like, it's just, it's mindless music. 
Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, but it's it's got a good beat. You can work to it. You can work out to it. Yeah. Uh, you can drive. I mean, I am in no way in the trapping game, but boy, do I feel like it when I listen to them on full time. There we go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> um, two last ones. Four, your one message to the next generation would be? Um, my one message to them, uh, care for one another. I love it, man. Last one. What does bread to build mean to you? Say it again. What does bread, what does the phrase bread to build mean to you? Oh, uh, it's the, it's the passion of doing uh, without the reciprocating of, of needing to do it. That was good, man. I like that. I Marcus. feel like everybody kind of trips out on that, <laughs> that, uh, that last phrase. They're I like, love it. Yeah. Sa- sourdough. Um, <laughs> we, it's always, it kind of no, hits no. you. It's like, you're made for doing it. Yeah. I love exactly. it, man. Uh, Marcus, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. I, w- I was fired up. You got me even more fired up. Uh, one thing that I will say, man, is your energy is absolutely contagious. Um, I'm really proud to have met you and I'm getting to know you more and more. But uh, yeah, again, just super proud that we had the opportunity to have you on the show. Um, yeah. as, as always, lastly, before we let you off the hook and do our outro, where can people find and connect with you? Uh, not me, connect with the company. So um, it, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm a part of it, but uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, at Gorse Construction. That's spelled G-O-R-E-S, Construction. Um, and you get to see some of the projects we do, um, what we're about, employee highlights and spotlights. Um, you'll get to see just truly how much we care about our folks uh, and, and honor them and all the hard work they put in. So uh, philanthropy efforts as well, uh, things like that are get posted on there. Um, but yeah, we, uh, uh, Gorse Construction, uh, at Gorse, spelled G-O-R-E-S, Construction. I love it, man. Guys, thanks for listening to the, I think it's 20th episode of the bread to build this podcast. Is definitely 20. This is definitely a good one for the big two Oh for us. Um, if you Sweet. like this episode, you like what we're doing, drop an awesome review. If you have any feedback or some topics in mind, feel free to send Matt or myself a direct message on hammer or Instagram. With that being said, you can connect with me personally on hammer at Brett going and also at we are hammer on IG Matt close it out. I- I'm sorry. I'm looking at their Instagram page. Um, you guys have like a crane on a floating dock in the middle of the ocean doing some <laughs> oh, stuff. That's on the, the river that runs through the center of Portland. So we fixed all the structural piers and pylons and, and beams underneath those three buildings, HOA community, uh, and had to work off of barges uh, during the tide wow. pools rising and falling. So those are the type of projects we do, just erroneously large and, and hard, logistically challenging. That was a fun one. If you guys are on Instagram, go check them out. They have quite a bit of work on here. It's some massive work as well. But we are 20 episodes deep. Thank you for listening. Um, if you want to connect with me, Matt Bangswood on every social outlet. We'll see you guys next time on the Bread to Build podcast.